Praise God. He's good. Amen. Amen. Can we give him praise one more time? He's so worthy. If he's done something in your life, we deserve he deserves a praise. Amen. Uh, if you're going in the middle of a, of a trial, he deserves the praise. If you just come out of one, praise God. He's so worthy. Amen. And we're going to we're going to see that even more so today as we uh, as we get into the word. This is uh, I thank God for his word because it truly is. It truly does help us no matter what we're facing, what we're going through. And uh, we've been just talking about, you know, how overcoming in, in stress and in all of these things, anxiety. And, and there's a lot of things in life that will do that to you. And sometimes what we don't understand or realize is we don't realize the Lord's deliverance in the middle of our struggles. Amen. And sometimes his deliverance through our struggles. And what an awesome, what an awesome God that we serve that he is able. He, he never leaves us helpless. He never leaves us hopeless. He's always with us. And I believe that as, as, the, as believers, as children of God, we need to recognize what God is doing in our lives. And I can tell you, I've seen God's hand of deliverance in my life. And even, even through, and especially through, I should say, the, the hard times and the difficulties of life when everything seems to be against you. Um, you know, the Bible tells us that, that there are three enemies, and we're going to learn a little bit about that today. Uh, it's the devil, the flesh, and, and the world. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, and sometimes, you know, we, we blame other things. We blame our problems on certain things or certain people. And, uh, and uh, what we need to do is we need to, we need to really ask and seek God's wisdom. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians 6, we're going to begin here. Because as we know, the, the, the walk of the believer, the believer's life is a battle. It is a struggle. You have been, when you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you enlisted in active duty. You are, you are, you are in the fight of your life. And you are in a fight for your life. Amen. And we need to, we need to know uh, how to war the the battle that we're in and we need to we need we need God to help us would you stand this morning Ephesians chapter 6 starting with verse 11 very familiar passage put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the powers against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places father we thank you today we thank you because god again father you you help reveal to us god where the attack is coming from we thank you because your presence is with us, God, and you've never left us. But Lord, you are with us in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. Father, when it seems like everything else is around us, around us seems to be uh, set on destroying us, God, and destroying our faith in you. And it's testing every part of us, God, every trial. But Lord, you are faithful today, God, and we just thank you for your faithfulness, God. We thank you, God, for the weapons of our warfare that are mighty through you to the pulling down of strongholds. That, God, that we can employ these weapons, Father, in, in the times that we need. That, Lord, that we learn, Father, that through you, that, God, that we can stand still and stand firm, Father, upon your word. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would help us to bring these things together today, God, so that we can, we can add, Father, to our arsenal today, God, so that we can be not just, over, not, not just simply get through, but we can be overcomers, God, by your word, through Christ who lives in us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen us and quicken us and help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers. Lord, may we, be, may, we, may we overcome in every area of our lives. 
We want to give you the praise and the glory today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Can we give him praise before you? You're seated. Praise God. You may be seated this morning as we begin. You know, we, we, we talk about these battles. The truth is, it's real. And if, if anybody in life is, is going to face struggles, going to go through problems, they're, they're, they're facing something. Um, a lot of times what happens is, even as, even as Paul has told us that um, our greatest enemy is Satan himself. Spiritual wickedness, high places. And when, when you're in the world and you don't have Christ or you don't know to turn to Christ, um, you are fighting a battle that you can't win. You're, you're in a struggle when you don't know Jesus Christ. You're, you're fighting a battle and you don't have the necessary, necessary resources to fight this battle. You, you don't realize that you are defenseless against the powers of darkness. And even as a believer, if we are not careful, we can fall uh, captive to the enemy. And it, because I, I think sometimes we think, oh, well, I'm a Christian, I should be okay. I can tell you this, if we don't walk in obedience, we are in trouble. And thank God for His deliverance, amen. Thank God for all of the times that He's brought us out. Um, sometimes the Bible, well, the Bible says that He took them in so that He could bring them out. And, and, and it was through the process that He was going to teach them, mold them, shape them, and help them to, to realize that they, were total, they needed to be totally dependent upon Him. And I don't know about you this morning, but I believe that we're going to learn a little bit more that we need to be totally dependent upon God in every area of our lives. So we're going to be talking about the, the struggles that we, that, that we fight on a, on a daily battle, if you will. They may be financial, they may be spiritual, they may be uh, through relationships, but, but these battles come in all shapes, forms, and sizes. And so in the Old Testament, uh, in Second Chronicles, and you can turn there, and I'll tell you in just a minute because I don't want you reading ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See, we know. <laughs> uh, in 2 Chronicles, there's a, there's a story of a king named Jehoshaphat. He's the king of Israel, and he got word from a friend that three nations were coming against him to, to destroy him and to destroy the nation of Israel and Judah. And, and, and so the odds didn't seem like they were too good for Israel. But the Bible says that uh, these three nations, um, they had Israel on the way in. It didn't, they, God told them, don't destroy them. And see, and this is something to walk in obedience, remember? When we walk in obedience with God, we need to understand God sees the big picture. And He has a purpose for everything that He does. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20... Starting with verse 1. Now I'll give you a second to get there. Second Chronicles 20 verse 1. After this the armies of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Menunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They're already at Hezeron Tamar. This was another name for En Gedi. So Jehoshaphat gets information that there are some enemies uh, that are coming against him. Three nations that are coming for war. And we're going to learn just a little bit today. There, there are some things that in every battle, whether you're, whatever you're facing today... Um, there, are some, there are some common factors that we must understand or see that Je Jehoshaphat had to see when the enemies were coming against him. And so the first thing that the, that the Bible teaches us is that we have to know who our enemy is. And so, you know, if you don't know who your enemy is, um, how do you know uh, 
how to come against them or, or how do you know uh, who you're fighting? Um, you will be, like Paul said, you'll be shadow boxing. You could be swinging at the air and you could be using your energy and getting nowhere. And I think a lot of Christians, Satan has, Satan has tricked them into this, that if he can just, he can just uh, move the focus or take your focus away from, from where the real problem is, then you'll expend all your energy doing getting nowhere. It's kind of like you ever see a hamster on a wheel? They just kind of run and run and they get nowhere. And how many times do Christians feel like that? Well, I came to know Jesus Christ, but my life really hasn't gone anywhere. Well, it's probably because you don't know who your enemy is. And so, to identify the enemy. Now, we, we think, you know, we, we may say, well, this, this seems pretty obvious, you know. Um, it's pretty obvious to, to, to know who you're fighting against. At least you would think it is. The truth is, is many people are fighting against a, a, a situation. They're, they're fighting against people. They're fighting against family members. They're fighting against different things. Uh, but many times, if we're not careful, if we don't identify the enemy, um, our enemy may be our own attitude. Oh. Man, Pastor, that one just came out of left field. <laughs> How are you handling a situation? You see, you may be working against yourself. You, we've all heard the saying, uh, two steps forward, or three steps forward, one step back. Or one step forward, three steps back. We've all heard it. And this is the way a lot of times we, we take our, our enemy and, and we think, oh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the handle on this. And, but what we don't realize is we're fighting the wrong battle. But in order to start winning the battle, you have to understand who your enemy is and who you're fighting against. And the Bible teaches us this, that we should not be ignorant of the enemy. We shouldn't be ignorant of how he comes against us. And so Jehoshaphat sees this, and, and then he has a reaction to this. And this is going to be very key for those of us, anybody who's facing a struggle, because whenever something comes against you, you'll have a reaction to it. doesn't mean that you respond to that reaction, but all of us, uh, all of us have a reaction. When we hear bad news, um, sometimes it's like our, our face gets flush. We're overwhelmed in the moment. You, you hear something, you hear good news, and, and you're just overwhelmed with joy, right? Well, Jehoshaphat has an, a reaction to this too. In verse 3, it says that Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news. He was terrified by the news. And so, so, so here's the thing. Um, our emotions begin to um, come into play. And, and we cannot be controlled and we must not be controlled by our emotions. Very easy to do though. Very easy to do. Somebody crosses you. They don't do that. Not around here. Right? I mean, it's very easy to react in the moment. Why? Because your emotions all of a sudden take over and you have this chemical change inside of your body and, and, and the old man wants to stand up and the old man wants to respond. And so the typical reaction for us is to allow our emotions to take control and then we begin to act irrational. We do something that we'll regret later. Thank God for Him protecting us against our emotions. You know, I don't know how many times God has closed the door before I could react, and I thank God for that. How many times has God intervened in your life and mine when we could have easily responded a, a, a certain way? And so we need to be careful because often, too often, so many people allow their emotions to take control of them. They get angry, they get mad, they're furious, and, 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 they, and if you're standing around them, you might suffer the consequences of their fury. 
You might be a victim of their words or worse. And this is a, this is a bad place to be um, if you're a believer. Mm. Boy, it got quiet. Because I know nobody in this place <laughs> deals with this. Your emotions begin to take, play, take over. Anxiety begins to set in. Everything else. One thing I've learned is, is that my emotions are undependable. I cannot depend upon my emotions. I don't walk by feelings. I live by faith. I can't allow my emotions to, 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 to persuade me or to sway my decision. Because in the moment, that's why it's so good to step back, take a breather, and think about what you're going to do next. And, 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 and we'll learn just a few more steps, but just to take a step back and allow your, yourself to process what it is that you, what has just happened to you. And I believe that this, this is sound advice for anybody. Just step back and take a few moments and allow yourself to process. Because in the moment, there are so many things that are happening inside of your mind, inside of your body. And it's easy to react. And I don't know, again, I, I mean, I'm not saying that I never have reacted. I have in the past, but I'm, I, I, I pray that I'm getting better at this. That even though I want to do something, God has protected me. And I'm so thankful that I, that I did not uh, react the way that I would have. Because later on, you think about it, you ever, see, you ever watch a movie and then it's like, Somebody says something or does something, and then all of a sudden you see the person diving over the table and, and eating into them, and, and then all of a sudden it comes back, and it was just, that's what they were thinking. That's the way it seems sometimes. You, you think, you stop and you process it, and you're thinking, man, if I would have said, or if I would have done, or if I would have, man, I could have ruined and made some huge mistakes. James tells us in chapter 1, because if we're not careful, um, we, can, we can do a lot more damage. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, he says, This you know, my, brother, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So, so be quick to hear. So, slow to speak. Slow to get angry. In other words, take, take your emotions. And, and, and Paul again teaches us this by, by telling us take every thought captive. Capture the thought. Hold on to it. Don't allow it to turn loose. Don't, allow, don't, don't turn it loose. Bring it, put it captive, lock the cage, and, and filter it through the presence of the Holy Ghost and say, God, is, is, is this acceptable? Because if I respond in anger, it does not produce or achieve the righteousness of God, which is very powerful. And then, and then he teaches us in 2 Timothy 1.7, and, and many of you know this, for God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and of a sound mind. When I respond in anger, I'm not responding in a sound mind. My mind is not sound. That's why you do things that are irrational or you regret later because you did not respond in a sound mind. And it's very easy. So all of us are emotional. All of us can get carried away if we're, we are not careful. But see, I believe that this is a part, and it goes so much deeper, and we can, we can stop here, do a whole study. This is the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, that, that, that when these things come in, we learn self-control, that we have the mind of Christ and put on the mind of Christ so that you can know the things. Because if I have the mind of Christ, I know the things of Christ. 
And so we need to be careful when we get into this because I can tell you this, I don't know, but I've noticed that through different stages of my life, uh, there are a lot of different things that are going through my mind. I don't think like I used to, but now I'm thinking differently. And sometimes it's a little bit weird. You think getting older is easy. (laughs) Should be. Praise God. So what do we do when, we, when, when our emotions and everything seems to be getting out of, getting out of control? In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, look at what Jehoshaphat does. In verse 3, it says, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. In, in, in the, the New Living, it says he was terrified, set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea. All Judah. Now, here's what he does. He sees the problem. He realizes that this is beyond him. And so he goes to the Lord. He takes it, he takes it to God. See, when, when, when he had learned that these nations were coming against him, he was terrified. And the Bible says he set himself to seek the Lord. He set himself to seek the Lord. And I think this is something that you and I need to understand if we are going to be successful against the attacks of Satan himself, against the things that are going to come against us in life. So he sets himself to seek the Lord. And so in order to to, to win or to, to overcome and to be an overcomer, we have to take everything, all of our problems to God. You know, and it, it... You say all of our problems, all of our problems. Here's here's the reason I say this. Because what we as humans do is, is, um, if I can take care of this, then I can take care of this. And we we, we, we have it in our mind that we get addicted to taking care of things. Instead of taking them to God. What we need to do, it doesn't matter how great, how small. Lord, um, put it before Him. Take it to God. Because then you'll get in the, you'll get in, it, 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 you'll get used to taking everything to the Lord in prayer. You know, I, I'm, I'm often reminded of this. And every time I think about this, I think about VBS because, um, and we do have it coming up. Um, but um, don't worry about anything. Come on, instead pray about everything. <laughs> you see, it's, it's, it's so true. And don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Because by worrying, um, what, do, what is it going to change? But if I can take it before God, He can change everything. And see, it doesn't matter if... And, and, I, and, and trust me, I've seen it. I've seen it happen to where um, people worry about it and it doesn't happen. Nothing comes about of whatever the situation is. And then I've seen it where people don't worry and it doesn't turn out like they should, but at least they didn't worry in the process. Because I can tell you this, you can't control the outcome. The only thing you can control is how you respond. And so whatever it is, just give it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. So we see that uh, we need to take all of our problems to, to the Lord. Uh, prayer ought to be our first weapon of warfare. It shouldn't be the last thing that we do. And too often it is the last thing we do because we're too worried about and too busy trying to take care of it on our own. And, and then if I can't fix it, then I'll take it to God in prayer. But Jehoshaphat, he prays. And this is what he says, and I find this so awesome, if you will, because there's so much to learn here. And, I, and, and again, we could, we could stop and spend weeks right here in these next few verses. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and I, I didn't want to just glaze over these because I wanted you and, 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 and I as believers to see what Jehoshaphat does as he prays. In verse 6, in, in 2 Chronicles 20, it says, He prayed, O Lord... God of our ancestors, you alone are are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. 
Our, oh, oh, our God, you did not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived. And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war, plague, or famine, we can come and stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us and you will hear us and rescue us. <laughs> Man, stop there or you're going to get in trouble. Because the pastor told you to stop and you're not stopping. Boy, I'm telling you, you're in trouble with God. <laughs> so Jehoshaphat comes in here and he, and he begins to remind God. First, he, he begins to lift his voice and praise God. God, you are, there is none like you. He's not trying to manipulate God. But he's worshiping God and giving God the worship that he deserves. And sometimes I think we've forgotten about that, that God, my problems are so big, my problems are this, and, and, and nobody can help me. And I, and I think a lot of modern day Christianity falls along these lines that, that, that my problems are so big, yeah, I, I want to pray about them, but pr does prayer really work? Because a lot of Christians don't believe that prayer really works. And I, and I think if we were to do a survey across the board, we would, we would be astonished at how, how many Christians, honestly, if you were honest and in your heart of hearts, how many Christians would say, I don't really believe that prayer really works as well as the Bible says that it does. Because the Bible tells me that what, whatsoever I ask in His name, He will do. And a lot of people are like, man, I've asked God for a lot of things that didn't come to pass. Mm. So he prays and he tells God, he says, you alone are the God of heaven. You rule all the, the earth. You're, you're all of these things. And see, here's the thing. Jehoshaphat had to, he wasn't reminding God. He was reminding himself of who he served. And some of you may need to remind yourself of who you serve. You serve the God of all heaven and earth. You serve the God who sits upon the throne. You serve the God who rides upon the wings of the wind. You serve the God who, who stands one foot on the land and one foot in the sea. And he stands taller than the stars. And you serve this God with my, with my, I know with my eyes I will see him. This is the God I serve. And this is what Jehoshaphat was doing. My God is mighty. And then what he does is he says, God, you brought these, us into this land. You didn't let, allow us to destroy them. But here we are. You gave it to your people and to your friend Abraham forever. See, God loves it when we remind him of his word. You say, well, this, is, this seems like a feeble practice. No, it's actually, it actually works. God, God expects me to come to him. And see, and this is, what, this is what Jehoshaphat was doing. He was reminding God of the promises that he made. And God says, when you come to me, you must believe that I am and that I am able to do what I said I would do. That I am and that I can. And that the things that I promise you, I'm able to fulfill them. And so, so he reminds them, because just a few chapters earlier, and we're not going to get into it, but, but remember the, the famous, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Well, in all of that prayer, you'll find what, what Solomon was praying, and this is what Jehoshaphat is repeating you said that when we come before your temple, whatever it is, that you would hear us and you would answer us. And so he's crying out to God for help that he would save them, that he would rescue them. And then in verse 10 he says, And now see that the armies of Ammon, uh, Moab, and Mount Seir are, are doing 
You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land. Which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh our God. Won't you stop them. We are powerless against this mighty army. That is about to attack us. We do not know what to do. But we are looking to you for help this is what he says I'm totally dependent upon you God I'm I'm doing everything I know that I'm that I can do I'm I'm bringing my problems to the Lord I'm reminding God of the promises that he has made to me Whatever it is that I'm facing, it doesn't matter where I'm at, what I'm going through. I can tell you there's a promise that'll meet it. And the thing is, is I need to know the word of God so that I can know the promises of God. Because the the Bible says that all his promises are yes and amen unto me, unto those that believe. And there are over 7,000 promises that are yes and amen unto me. And so I come to God and I, said, and I say, God, you said in your word this, this, and this. You said you will. You said this. I'm here. I'm coming to you. I believe you, you are who you say you are. And I believe that you are able to do what you said you would do. And so what he does, what Jehoshaphat does in this moment, and, th- and this, is, this is going to be uh, the, the fourth thing that you need to understand is you need to admit that you need help. Boy, oh boy. Now see, um, just look straight up here. Don't look side to side. Don't look at your wives and husbands. (laughs) The wives are all thinking, that's not hard. (laughs) Stop asking for directions. No, I got it. Thank God for Google these days, huh? But men, it's hard. And, and, and some people may say, well, well, it's not hard for me. I can tell you this, um, it's hard to ask for help. Why? Because we're men. We were made this way. There are a lot of reasons, and I don't have time to get into all of the reasons. Um, but I will just put it out there, ladies. I'll, I'll put it out there um, that... A lot of times men will suffer in silence because they don't want to worry you. They don't want you to think differently of them. We are supposed to be strong. We are supposed to stand firm. We're supposed to be the rock in our relationship. We are committed to the things that we say. And we'll follow through even if it kills us. But we're not going to let you know that we need help. So, it's a hard thing. But this is... Anyone who... You know what I'm talking about. And so for men, it's, it's very difficult to admit that we need help. And this is why so many men suffer in silence. They say the suicide rate of, 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 of men is higher than women. They say women try or, or, or uh, try it more often, but are less successful. Men are more successful. Because they don't have anyone else to turn to. But hear me, men. That's why we have a men's group. That's why we have small group. That's why, that's why we can come together and the Bible says as iron sharpens iron, so does one brother sharpen another. And this is why we need to stand arm in arm with our men. And we need to find the men that are out there that are hurting. And, and because we know what they think and, and how they process that, we need to go and we need to stand with them. And we need to bring them into the, into the, the, the to the, to relationship and fellowship of the saints so that we can lead them to the cross 
So that, because that's where we find our, our strength. That's where we find our hope. That's where we find our help. That's why, honestly, sometimes when you're sitting there and you're thinking and you ask your husband and he's just been sitting there on the couch or whatever, he may be watching something. He's not watching you. And you're, you're, you, you may say, well, what are you thinking about? And he'll say nothing because he's thinking about everything all at the same time. And he's just trying to work it out. He's just trying to process it. And he's just trying to make heads and tails of it all. It's true. But we have to admit that we need help. If we're going to win against the struggles that we face in this life. Look what he says in verse 12. Again, we are powerless before this great multitude who are come against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. In, verse, in, in the New Living Translation, it says, Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. See, we need to look to the Lord and, 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 and not uh, look at our problems. We need, to, we need to take our needs before God. This is so obvious. We've been told this again and again. But it's true. We need to just come and, and be honest and open with God. This is, this is why I believe as believers, as, as men of God we, and, and women of God, but as men of God, we have, we have something that the world doesn't have. We have someone to go to. I can take anything to the Lord. I can express how I feel. I can tell Him where I'm at. I can tell Him I don't know what to do in this circumstance. I don't know what to do with this situation. But God, I need your help. I need wisdom. I need understanding. Because God is the only person that can help us. He's the only person that can help us many times. And so we stand one another, with one another. We encourage one another. We strengthen one another. But our help comes from God. This is what the Bible teaches us. We as human beings, we need help. We need to look at the Lord and say, Lord, I've got a problem. I admit I'm weak. Admit that I am not adequate for the, for the situation. That's, that's, that's hard as men, but I'm, I'm just trying to help you out. I'm, and, and ladies also, because sometimes even as ladies, I'm sure, um, especially single moms who are trying to do it all and trying to get it all into place. I can tell you, I, I'm sure that there are times when you just feel overwhelmed. And, and here's the thing, just bring it before God because He's faithful. The life that you and I are living is a supernatural life. It is, the, the, the Christian walk is a supernatural walk. And it, and it will take more than the natural power that you have to be successful. You are going to need the power of Christ that is in you to begin to operate in you and work through you. We need God's strength. We need His power but he expects us to ask he he has no shortage of power and the bible says that 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 we need to come to him look at what he says in james 4 and 6 god opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble and when we're too proud to ask god doesn't respond whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved. You see what Jehoshaphat does here? He says, you said that when we have a problem, whether armies, whatever it may be, famine, whatever it is, to come to the temple to ask you for help and you would help us. And as a believer, I can tell you, I, can, I go to the, I run to the mountain and the mountain stands by me. I find my help in the Lord. I can go to God as long as I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I can, I can find refuge and strength in His presence. I don't have to worry about these things. And when, I, and, and when that happens and when we take those things to the Lord, what do we do next? I can tell you what you do next. You depend on the power of God. 
That's it. You depend on the power of God. Look what he does. He says, Lord, I don't know what to do. And then he adds, but our eyes are on you. In other words, um, it's almost like, it's almost like uh, your move. You see, I'm, I've, I've done, I've walked in obedience. I've done what you told me to do. I've come before your temple. We built it to honor you. And now in obedience, I'm standing here before you. Your turn. That's, that's, that's powerful. You see, I don't, I, I, honestly, I think Christians need to remember this and be reminded of this. That God, I've done everything that you told me to do and I'm, and I'm, and I'm trusting fully in you. Now it's your turn, your move. And, 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 and God, God loves, that's why he says, they that come to me must believe. You must have faith when you come before God. So we have to keep our eyes on God. We have to rely on his strength, rely on his power. He is able to do what he said he would do. And, and, and so this, is, this, this leads right into once we rely on his power, um, while we're waiting, we rest in faith. We rest in faith. We, we have, in other words, we have complete confidence in God. We, we know that He's able to do it. And now what we're doing is we're waiting on you to do it. We're waiting on you, God, to do what you promised to do. And we rest in faith. And this is what He says in verse, four, uh, verse 15. He says, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. See, this is the response that he gets from God. Is the battle is not yours, it is God's. This is what the Lord says, do not be afraid, don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Man, what a powerful thought. You're sitting there and you're asking God to do something. And then all of a sudden God speaks. <laughs> Boy, I can tell you this. You can sit back and eat your pie and whatever you want to do. Because, because God has spoken. See, this is, the, this is the beautiful thing about walking in obedience to God. You, I couldn't overstress that. I could not overstress that. That when we walk in obedience to God, the Bible says that because we do the things that He asks us to do, we can have this confidence that whatever we ask, He'll do it. What a powerful thought. So many Christians today, they're totally worn out because they're trying to fight the, the battle in their own strength, in their own abilities, in their own power. They're not trusting in God. They tend to think that, God doesn't care. They tend to think, well, well, God used to respond, but He doesn't respond anymore. You know, uh, when you first got saved, it's, it's a beautiful thing because you have all this zeal and you're just like, oh God, I'm going to run and I'm going to run right into the enemy's camp and, and I'm going to tear hell apart and I'm going to be the one that, I'm going to run back out with the victory, right? And then after you run in there a little while and you come back out a little worn down, <laughs> worn out, then you realize, Lord, I'm sorry, I've disappointed you. How many times have we tried to do something and, and we've disappointed, we feel like we've disappointed God. We feel like we've disappointed God because, because we failed in our attempts. And the reason we failed in our attempts is because we haven't learned to take those things to Him, trust in His power, and then rest. Because sometimes God doesn't respond quick enough, so, so, so we just say, well, maybe God didn't hear, or maybe God wants me to help, and we become like Abraham, and when God tells him, oh, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, and him and Sarah are like, we're old, and they get into it a little bit, about 13 years into it, and they're just like, you know what, um, maybe God just wants us to do it another way. So they bring the handmaiden in, and see, and sometimes this is the way that we respond to God, we because God's taking a while, well, maybe I need to help 
God along. You don't need to help God. Can I tell you that? You don't need to help God. And here's the truth. When we, when we feel like we've... Uh, attack of the enemy. When we feel like we've let God down. We tend to run from God. And what God's saying is... Um, you weren't the one holding me up. How could you let me down? It's, it's, it's like... You, if, you're, if you're not careful, we can get into this whole thing like I need to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this. But when you came to know the Lord, what did you have to offer God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing except your will. And, and you said to God, I, I, you know, here I am. If you can use nothing, use me. See, the truth is, is we have to realize that without God's power, we don't have any power at all. You've never been able to do it on your own. You'll never be able to do it on your own. And if you're going to continue and if you're going to fight the, the good fight, you're going to need the power that God gives. John 15 and 5 tells it this way. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. You abide in him. I abide in you. And this is what he says. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What part of nothing don't we understand? Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. You can do absolutely nothing. Are you serious, pastor? I can do nothing. No, you can do absolutely nothing to affect the spiritual realm apart from God. You and I have to be connected to him. And God wants us to rest in faith. He wants to be able to work through us. But as long as we have our hands on the control, he won't take, he won't take charge. And we want to, oh, I'll get it from here. I'll get it from here. No, no, no. God's saying, until you let go of it and give it to me, I'll, then, then I can't do anything. Colossians 2 and 6 says, if you, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. In other words, when you received Christ, it wasn't in your strength, it wasn't by your might, it wasn't by your power. So to walk in Christ, it's not going to be by your strength, by your might, by your power, because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so we need to learn as believers, the Christian walk is a walk of faith. You became a Christian by trusting in God. You will continue to be a Christian by trusting in God. God has never broken his promise and he never will. I love what he says in verse 17, Second Chronicles 20. He says, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. You want to come? So what does it mean to stand firm when you've got a problem? It means to have faith, but it means to have confidence in God. It's a a mental attitude of quiet confidence that says, no matter what I see, I trust God. I don't live by sight, I trust God. Because a lot of times the things I'd see can be very deceiving. You know, I I know a lot of times we say, you know, that we we used to believe, or what they used to say is, don't don't believe everything you, and half of what you, (laughs) don't believe everything you hear and half of what you see. You see these, you see these uh, artists that they can, you know, Again, do that whole deception thing. Pay no attention to this hand over here because this is the one. They're distracting you. And Satan, that's exactly what he wants you you to do is he wants you to focus on something that is not real. Even as Mario was saying, fear. You see, and and so he's, he's trying to get your eyes off of God. 
Sadly enough, some people have taken their eyes off of God a long time ago. And what God is saying is, put your eyes back on me. See, because Jehoshaphat learned, he says, our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. When Peter was walking in the storm, same thing. God didn't stop the storm. He didn't calm the storm. The, everything was still as it was. But as long as he kept his eyes on Christ, he was okay. And I can tell you this. God may not calm the storm in your life today. But don't take your eyes off of him. Because a lot of times that's what we pray. We, we pray, God, just calm the storm. But when we put it in God's hands, we're saying, God, um, you do it your way. You do it your way. Because God, God's ways are higher. God's thoughts are higher. The outcome will be greater if we can put it in God's hands. <clears throat> and finally, what we see, and this is something I believe that all of us need to learn, is we just need to give God the praise. We need to give God praise before the storm. We need to give God praise in the middle of the storm. We need to give God praise after the storm. We just need to give God the praise. Amen. He's worthy of all praise. <clears throat> I won't read it, but it tells us that Jehoshaphat, as he's facing these people, that God tells him, they, the Bible says that they just began to worship God. They just began to worship him. And, and so then they sent out and, and, and God tells them how to set it up. He says, this is, this is how you're going to do it. Instead of putting the big guns out front, instead of putting the infantry, and instead of putting the tanks, and instead of doing that, he says, this is what we're going to do. I want you to put the worship team out front. That's what he said. Because they started to praise God after they had got the response. They had begun to, to praise God. And, and you can hear it in Jehoshaphat's prayer in the beginning. God, you are. There's none like you. And he's praising him. And he's giving him the glory. I, the Bible tells us that God inhabits, lives in the praises of his people. Not the, not the boo-hoo. Not the murmuring, whining, complaining misery of his people. He lives and inhabits the praises of his people. Why? Because, because that's, how we, that's what, how we approach him. We, praise is, is, is coming before him in faith and saying, God, there is none like you, my God, my King. The devil will be like, but don't you see the armies that are before you? Yes, but you don't understand my God. So the Bible says that the praise team goes out before the army. And what happens is the three countries that are coming against them, they actually destroy themselves. Because God told them, he says, you don't have to do anything in this. I'll do it all. You just need to praise me. My presence will go before you. I'll take care of your enemies. I'll take care of whatever circumstances you're facing. I'll take care of whatever situation you have found yourself in. If you can just find it in you to, to give me the praise that I deserve. See, and Satan, Satan was trying to keep them from this point. Satan, Satan doesn't want you to praise God in the midst of your trial because he knows that, that when, when you begin to praise God, God shows up. It's not that he's, never, he's, he's ever left you, but God shows up ready for battle. It's, it's almost like when you praise God, it's, it's like you're calling upon the name of the Lord. God, there is none like you. I give you the glory. I give you the honor. I give you the praise. Could you stand this morning? We wanna, we're going to praise the Lord in just a minute. I... I 
I believe that there are some things that maybe some of you are facing right now and you're going to need to praise God in the middle of your battle. You see some things, you, maybe you see something coming and it's almost inevitable and you, need, and you need God to help you. And I can tell you this, praise God before it gets here. Praise God if it gets here and praise God through it and praise God after it. You see, the Bible says in, in verse 25, when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found, they found much among them, including goods, garments, valuable things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry. And they were there three days taking the spoil because there was so much. Satan doesn't want you to live in the abundance that God has for you. And so he's going to hit you because when he hits you, if you allow your emotions to take over, why did you allow this to happen to me, God? If you allow your emotions to take over, God, I can't believe this. I've, and, and, and instead of reminding God of his promises, you, you start to, God, I, I, I did everything that you said, but you didn't come through. Or God, I've served you all of these years to be treated like this, to be left alone out here. See, so that's where Satan wants you. But if we can just put all that aside and remember that we live by faith, not by sight, we can begin to praise God. And God, God says, those, that's my people. And there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're struggling with some things. Maybe there's some stuff that's happening in your life, in your marriage, um, work, whatever it may be. You just need to praise God. You might be like, but pastor, I'm supposed to praise God for the trouble in my... Yes, praise God. Because <laughs> all it is is an opportunity for Him to show up. It's an opportunity for him to step in and to prove that he is who he says he is. Maybe you're here today and maybe you need that. Maybe you're here today and you're fighting a battle, you're fighting a struggle. Before we get into all of that and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm not saying that you don't know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You haven't allowed him to take control. See, none of this that we talked about is even accessible to you until he becomes Lord and Savior. Absolutely none of it. I, and and I, I, you know, I mean, I didn't, I'm not the one that wrote the book. He did. He doesn't go against his word like some would say. The only way that you can have the promises of God, all these promises are yes and amen unto them that believe that are called according to His purpose. Those that have surrendered their lives to Him, they can call upon His name. But today, you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And from this moment, He's your help. He's your strength. He's your banner. He's the one that goes before you. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know about Jesus, but I don't have a relationship with him. I want to pray with you. If you're watching online and, and you, you, know, you, you may be thinking, I, I know about God, but I don't know him, then I want to pray with you. If you're here today, watching online today, uh, I want you to pray with us as we pray this simple prayer. Because it's not so much in the words, but it's the heart that you pray it with. And then we'll move on to the next part of our service. But Father, would you pray, forgive me because I am a sinner. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. For giving your body as a sacrifice in my place. Forgive me of all of my sins. And I ask you today to be my Savior, my Lord, and my God. Holy Spirit, come and live in me. Be my counselor, my friend. Teach me how to live my life in a way that honors and pleases the Father. 
I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, today, we just come before you, Lord. And Lord, we want to just, we just want to give you praise. In this place, God, we know, Father, that there are many, there are many difficulties that your people are up against, Father, that we face, God. Father, from from politi- the political arena down to our, our personal struggles, God. Lord, there's so much, Father, that, that could easily overwhelm anyone. But our help is in you, God. Our trust is in you. Lord, would you help us this morning? Would you help us this morning? What I want to do is I want to, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and I want you to, I just want to take the next few moments and I, I just want us to praise God. And if you have something that you're facing a trial, I, I invite you. It's always, an in, the, the altar is always open. This is an open invitation just to come and, and give God the praise. You say, well, why do I have to? You don't have to come up here, but I'm telling you, there's something that happens when you step out in faith. And you just, you just begin to give God the praise and the glory. And, and, and basically, it's by faith we're just stepping forward and saying, God, I need everything that you have. I need all that you have for me. And, and we're just giving it to God. We're just giving it to God. So as the worship team prepares, I, I want you to just, just give it to God. I, I welcome you to come up to the front and we're going to worship God for a few moments and, and we're going to see what God is going to do in your life. You say, you say, pastor, you really think that God is going to help me with whatever I'm facing? I guarantee. And it doesn't matter my guarantee. His word declares that if you do it his way, he will help you. And I can tell you, if you have enough faith to take a step and just to give him the praise that he deserves, everything changes. Everything changes. Would you, would you just, as we begin, Father, we just thank you, God. We just give you the glory. Lord, you see the circumstances Lord, we want to worship you and we want to praise you. We want to give you all the glory, Father, that is due your mighty name. Would you give him praise this morning? Hallelujah. Father, you're so worthy, God. Father, we know, God, even in this place, God, you inhabit the praises of your people. It's your move, God. Lord, you see the needs, God, that are represented in this place. And Lord, all we've done is followed your instructions. God, we're waiting on you. Father, for you're greater than everything that we are facing. Our problems, Father, have become small in light of who you are, God. Today, we want to exalt you. We want to lift you up. We want to thank you, God. For you you and you alone are worthy, God, of all worship, of all praise, of all honor and glory, God. We exalt your name, Father. Father, be King and Lord of our lives, O God. Continue to strengthen us, Father, as as we go out and we face those things. And God, I pray that, Father, that when others see us, God, they see, Father, your presence in us. They may know, Father, what we're going through. But, God, they will not see the reaction to the problem. But they'll they'll see the response to who our God is. That you are greater, Father. And I pray that, God, that we would be reminded always to worship you, to, to praise your name, God. That in the midst of our praise, you inhabit the praises, Father, of your people. And that, God, that your presence would fill, Father, whatever room, whatever place, Father, that we, that, that where we are, God. I pray that in Jesus' mighty name, others would sense, Father, your presence and know, God, that you are with us. For, God, we truly are a people of your presence. I pray that, God, that we would not be discouraged. But Father, even as your servant encouraged himself in the Lord, God, that we would encourage ourselves in you for our help comes from you.
Thank you so much, God. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit, your strength, your power. Thank you for intervening in our lives, God, and always being there. We give you all the praise. Can we praise him one more time? In Jesus' name. He hears you. He answers. And uh, he will do what he's promised he would do. God bless you.